talking about DNA and different things, but we're not there yet. So, I want to preface this lesson with this um, verse right here, Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, the reason I put this up here is there are things we're going to talk about in this lesson and different viewpoints that we look at. And sometimes we can get caught up in the trees and we don't see the whole forest. And sometimes I think that people get too wise for their own good and see too many facts and they lose perspective on what's around us. You know, we look around at this creation and we may get caught up in, well, we can prove this and we can prove this and if this happened and that happened, we can create this narrative and this all fits together and makes a pretty puzzle. And we get so concerned with looking at the puzzle pieces and how they fit together that we don't look at the picture that you're making. And we look around at this creation and we see the beauty and the wonder of it. And sometimes we may, and especially outside of the church, we may lose perspective on what is going on here. And the truth of it is we don't have all the answers. We don't have all of the picture. We can't. We have very small minds compared to the mind of God. And we can't understand everything that's going on. And that's the biggest thing is trying to convince people who think they have all the answers and think they are the authority to take a step back and be a little more humble and realize you don't have all the answers. You don't have all the information. And we can't have all the information. So just a small review. This is the last slide I got to. And I want to just kind of reset our minds to where we were last week. So... Last week we outlined some historical artifacts, details, evidences that show Christ to be a real man, to have lived on this earth. And these are some of the arguments I found in that study that people claim that Jesus may have been real, but probably not. Um, but most of the gospel accounts were forgeries and things like that. And a lot of them said, you know, when you transcribe a document over and over, people would change things. Christians would take the historical writings of Josephus and others and change them around. And one of the big things that I found over and over is that the idea in the middle there where it says um, Jesus was an archangel from Judaism and he was repurposed to be Christ. Or Jesus is a knockoff idea of Osiris and Adonis, Romulus, Zalamoxus, Inanna, Mithra, etc. And there are so many of these ideas. Mithra is one that I had been familiar with when I was in college. The idea that there is this, there was a sun god. He was called a sun god, S-U-N, God. And he came to earth and he, and this was a Roman mystery religion, and he lived on the earth and he was killed. His birthday was December 25th, which a lot of people who claim to be Christians would also associate with Jesus. And they drew all these parallels and said, and he predated Jesus by 100, 200, 300 years. So therefore, it's really easy to see that whichever one came first is probably more authentic than a copycat. And so the idea is that if you look at all this body of historical research and all of this, you say, well, Jesus is just an amalgam of all these ideas that people piece together and put together to fit their own story. And we know that that's not the case, but if you want to build a case, you can find all the data you need based on the bias as we talked about in the first few weeks. If you want to have an argument, you can find enough facts to fit it. And that's what a lot of times happens. Um, and then even claiming that Christians, uh, Christianity was a Jewish cult that wanted to remove the temple and blood sacrifices and blood magic was you know, common in many religions at that time. And so they said that, you know, Judaism was no different and that it was just using these same tropes that other religions and other cults had used throughout the ancient world. And their idea was that um, in Rome, this idea of Christianity rose up as just kind of a revolt against the Roman people, and, or against the Roman um, Empire, and that over time, you know, through their persecution and other things, People lost faith in it, nearly died out, and then the Gospels were written to kind of bolster this idea, and then it rose up, and then once Constantine, the emperor, adopted it as the official religion, it exploded. Um, and that's kind of the narrative that's been put forth. But in this lesson, I want to look at the context of the religious world. I want to look at the need for authority 
or I'm sorry, uh, the tug of authority, the need to be right, and uh, I can't even read my last one there, um, and the need for answers. I think these are the things that people outside of the church and that non-believers, these are the holes they're trying to fill with whatever they believe. So, the context of the religious world. This right here are two, these are two graphs that kind of show where, create, where Christianity sits within the world. And when I use Christianity in this term, it refers to anyone who's going to claim to be a Christian. It's going to be anyone who believes that Jesus was the Son of God in whatever context they think that's the case. I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about a wide-ranging view here. And on the circle graph, you can see right here, this is going to be Christianity. And it constitutes about 33%, 2.4 billion people. This includes Catholicism. This includes all of the different viewpoints of uh, Christianity. Number two, we have Islam. And then secular atheist is the third. It's this gray one here, and that's about 16%. And after that, they begin to fall off a little bit and become more regionalized, Hinduism, Buddhism, and then you get down to ethnic religions and very small ones that constitute much smaller amounts. In this area, if we were to look at Alabama alone, that would look far different. And I want to show you in the next few slides what different populations look like um, spread over the globe. So Christianity, as you can see, is concentrated very heavily in Africa, in South America, in Russia, Australia, and in the United States. Northern Africa, we don't see it. The Middle East, we don't see it. And in Asia, we don't see very much Christianity. Islam, however, is concentrated in those very areas. It's kind of a clear divide between the two of them. If you're not part of the Christian world, you're part of the Muslim world. And there's a few exceptions. Um, I believe this one right here is Hinduism, and then Buddha, or this is Buddhism, Hinduism, there's the Buddhist. Um, and we can see where they're concentrated in Asia. And this right here is the atheist or secularist. Russia, the United States, and more developed countries. And that's the thing that I find most interesting about, oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's a Jewish population. And I guess this one right here. In the developed countries, we see this is the atheistic or secularist. Um, much of Russia, much of Scandinavia, Europe, and the United States and Canada. This is on the rise also. We see more and more people leaving ideas of religion in favor of just, you know, either atheism, agnosticism, or just an idea of we don't know or don't care. You know, I'm going to live my life and make myself happy, and I'm not going to be concerned with anything bigger than me, greater than me, anything outside of that. And this is why I believe this is important to look at this. When you look at secularism or atheism, they're going to automatically draw it into two camps. They're going to draw it into believers and non-believers, skeptics and non-believers. Skeptic is a word that's thrown around quite a bit. And the idea is either you are superstitious and you believe in some supernatural something, or you don't. Now, the problem is, when you start trying to discuss or debate or enlighten someone who has that viewpoint, you are not only representing members of the Church of Christ, but you fall into the category of every other religion and every other superstition, every other faith that belongs in this world. And when you have so many different beliefs that are at odds, that disagree, that have different viewpoints, you still represent them in their mind. Of course, we know that we disagree on most points with a lot of different uh, belief systems. There's very little in common that I see with a polytheistic uh, view of Hinduism that has many different gods that mean many different things and Christianity. And yet, when you discuss this with someone outside the church, we find that there's divisions. So to a non-believer, you first find that we all fall into this religious group. You second find that we split to believers in Christ or other religious systems. 
And remember, only 33% is Christian to begin with. So even when you take the 16% out that's secularist or atheistic, we still have a majority of people that believe in religions in this world that are not Christian. That constitutes a greater amount than people who are, and yet we still, to a non-believer, represent that group. So we have to find some way when discussing this with people who don't believe um, in any type of religious idea that there is reason to. And then once you even break it down beyond that, we find that believers in Christ can be then divided into the Church of Christ or you know, the Christian, Christians who are following the Bible as closely as possible or the denominational world or people who are Christians in their mind, in their opinion, but do not necessarily hold the Bible as sola scriptura, which means only by the Word. And that's what we try to do in our daily lives. Um, any thoughts, ideas about this right here? Or anything that I've said so far? So, the thing is, when you're discussing this with someone that is not a believer, we tend to go by this rule of thumb that's called the wisdom of the crowds. And we see it all the time. If you see um, one person doing something, then two people, then three people, it can have a slow trickle effect. And the classic example um, is from uh, at a 1906 county fair in Plymouth, 800 people participated in a contest to estimate the weight of a slaughtered and dressed ox. Stati statistician Francis Galton observed that the median guess of uh, 1,207 pounds was accurate to within 1% of the true weight, 1,198 pounds. This has contributed to the insight in cognitive science that crowds' individual judgments can be modeled as probability distributions of responses with the median centered near the true value of a quantity to be estimated. All that says is, if a lot of people are doing it, it's probably the right thing to do. But if you look at the church, we constitute a very small percentage of Christianity that only constitutes 33% of the seven and some odd billion people on this planet. If you follow the wisdom of the crowds, we aren't it. And it's very hard to overcome this idea. You know, so much of the time, people like to cheer for a winner or like to cheer for, if something's popular, it gains more popularity. And then as it gains popularity, especially um, one great place to observe this is the internet, YouTube videos. A very small percentage of YouTube videos get much traction. But when they do, they take off exponentially. And it's because this idea of as something gains popularity, it gains more and more and more popularity. This is what happened to Christianity in its early days. But now it's a very different idea. It's not pervasive in the thought that, yes, maybe 33% of the globe claims to be a Christian. And yes, 80%, over 80% has some belief in something. But when it's so scattered, then it's not really focused on the idea of Christ as we see it. So, the next thing is why this has come to be the case. And if you go back 200 years, this isn't the case. Most of the world is a religious or superstitious place. Some places have not had Christianity thoroughly taught in those areas, and they have ethnic religions or they have local religions. But going back about 200 years, most of the European world and the places that had been conquered by Europe or had been... Um, become part of European empires were either were some t type of Christian area. But at the same time, the Enlightenment began. And the Enlightenment was an idea that we can use reason, we can use study, and we can use facts to determine the world around us. So the idea came that if we can't prove it, then we don't need to necessarily believe it. And so here's the idea of the tug or the um, argument from authority. And this is where if someone has an authoritative position, you listen to them. We do it all the time. I'm standing up here. You're listening to me. You think I'm an authority on this. I'm not. You know, every one of you are as smart as I am. It's just I've taken a little bit of time in this area. We all have something we are an authority on. 
and people should listen to us in those areas. But the thing is, sometimes people claim to be authorities in areas that they're not, or people think they are an authority when they're not. And the argument from authority is based on the idea that a perceived authority must know better than a person should, uh, and that a person should conform to their opinion. This has its roots in psychological cognitive biases such as the Ash Effect. In repeated and modified instances of the Ash conformity experiments, it was found that high status individuals create a strong likelihood of a subject agreeing with the obvious false conclusion despite the subject normally being able to clearly see the answer was incorrect. This is the idea, and I've heard a great example where a person in a uh, waiting room a buzzer would go off, a lady would stand up. This was, a, it was an experiment. People are sitting in a doctor's office and a buzzer goes off and one lady stands up. Everybody just looks at her like she's silly. But then they bring in another person. Two of them stand up the next time. Before long, all the people who were part of the experiment had left the room and yet every time the buzzer would go off, everyone would stand up. It's the conformity of the crowd and the idea that, well, she knew what was going on. She's the authority in this situation. I should listen to her. And before long, everyone's doing something and no one in the room knows why they're doing it. And this is a scary, scary, scary thought. We can't have all the answers. We don't necessarily know enough to do much of anything in this world. We have to live by faith. And very often, I'm afraid this is exactly how the world takes everyone around. Like I said in previous lessons, most all of us here were raised in Christian households, whether members of the church or just the larger group of believers. And I sometimes look at myself and try to evaluate, if I was born in India and was not exposed to Christianity except as an alternative, out there, other idea and was not given the opportunity to study it, I fear that I would be just a good little Hindu. If I was born in Northern Europe where Christianity was just that group of crazy people and I was never introduced to the idea that there's a lot of actual scientific validity and proof to it, I'm sure I'd be a militant atheist. But luckily we've been blessed to grow up in an area where we have been exposed to the gospel. And that's why it's our duty to actually diligently study the scriptures, study historical ideas and beliefs, study the philosophy on it, study the science of it, and validate for ourselves that we're not just being led by some idea that we don't know where it's coming from. Any thoughts, comments, ideas? Go ahead. And that's because the most beautiful thing about the church to me, as opposed to people who claim to be believers, is where the authority is. You know, you go in any, any assembly of the church and you will hear the preacher or whoever speaking say, don't take my word for it, go look in the Bible. That's the authority. And yet, I don't feel that if you go to other places the authority is the Bible, the authority becomes whoever is speaking. I I've, I've, may have told the story before, but I had a friend growing up, and she grew up in a denomination, and she said that you know, she believed that she knew she was going to heaven already, and no matter what, she was going. 
And I said, well, how do you know that? I said, if I were you, and I already knew I was going to heaven, I'd do whatever I wanted for the rest of my life. I said, and I said, well, you know, where do you get that bag? She said, I'm going to get my granny after you. And I thought, okay, so your authority is your granny. Your granny says that that's the case, and so you're going to follow that instead of Scripture. And way too often, this is what authority does to us. We put our authority in our parent, our grandparent, whoever's standing in front of us in the, in the pulpit, and we don't keep the authority as the Bible. Yes, it is so important that if you're going to speak to someone who does not have their authority as the Bible, you have to be able to talk to them on their terms. As we discussed last week, Paul became what he needed to to others to preach the gospel to them. We have to meet people where they're at. And if they're not in the Bible, we have to be able to speak to them in terms outside the Bible. But we know that when it comes to Scripture, that's our authority on how we live our lives. And that's how we have to continue to go. Anything else? Go ahead. You're giving the example of you not been born and raised where you were, what you would be like. And I think that just goes to a, a challenge for all of us. And that is when we talk about the uh, impact of searching for truth. So we know on a personal level, if we search for truth, it's going to require effort and potentially change. Mm -hmm. And we don't really like either one of those much, much of the time. You're right. And then those in authority know that if there is a search for truth, that then they are probably, if they know they don't have the truth, they're going to lose the power and authority that they right. have. So you have two different, at least two different dynamics working mm -hmm. against that. And that's why we don't do it. And the world definitely does something. You're right. And that's where the next, well, here's some quotes, and they, for some reason my font changed, and they don't fit on the screen, so I'll read them off of here. And this is a quote by Carl Sagan, um, who is a scientist and astronomer. Uh, One of the greatest commandments of science is mistrust arguments from authority. Too many such arguments have proved painfully wrong. Authorities must prove their uh, contentions like everybody else. Way too often, people will take the word of someone, and someone believes they're an authority and just spouts off something they may not be sure of, but they're an authority, and people go along with it. Well, here's a scientist saying one of the most important things as a scientist is still to be able to prove what you're saying. Um, another one, this is from Galileo. Uh, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. And this goes back to the very first scripture I started with. We can get caught up looking at all the things and all the things we can prove and get lost in the idea that look around us. We're here. There's something here and there's more than we can explain with science. Don't get caught up in only the things that you can prove because you can spend your entire life searching for facts and never find the real answers. And he followed up. I guess I lost that slide. Some, I guess this is a mess this morning. Uh, but the example that I think of is the watchmaker analogy. And I think of Psalm 19.1 with this. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. And the idea of the watchmaker analogy is if you're walking along the beach and you find a pocket watch laying there, you don't assume that it just happened. You don't assume that it's laying here and I don't know how it got here. I'm going to think of all the ways that geology and all the ways that different things could have conspired together to create this pocket watch on the beach, you assume that someone dropped it and that it's been left there and was made in a watch shop somewhere. And yet with our intricately designed universe and with the earth that we live in, with all the things that are built just so for life, we have a large contingency of people who get caught looking at the small aspects that they can study and forget the overarching idea. Here's the last quote by Galileo. Um, if anyone shall set authority of holy writ against clear and manifest reason, he who does this knows not what he has undertaken. For he opposes the truth, not the meaning of the Bible, which is beyond his comprehension, but rather his own interpretation, not what is the Bible, but what has found himself and he imagines there to be. So the idea is... We have to look at the Bible and study it and then look at the universe around us and realize that they are in harmony. 
The Bible does not say one thing and nature show us another. And yet sometimes that is the case that people want to believe. So, religious belief among the general public and scientists, and this comes from Pew Research, so this is, this is pretty well established research. If you look at the general public, 83%, and I'm guessing this is American public, 83% uh, believe in a God or believe in God. And yet, in the scientific community, that drops down to 33%. Um, the next group is 12% who don't believe in God but do believe a universal spirit or a higher power. And so that takes us up to about 95% believe that in the general public. And yet, only 18% believe that in the scientific community. The blue area is only 4% say there's nothing in the general public, and yet 41% of the scientific community believes that. I believe this is a situation where we have people who believe they're in authority. We have people who've studied their field, and when you study your field, you feel like you're an authority on it. I feel pretty confident talking to a bunch of eighth graders every day about the science I'm supposed to teach. I don't think they know more about it than I do. And I believe this is the case with college professors or research scientists. They get to where they're at the top of their field. They're writing these papers. They are the authority, and no one can know more than them. There's not something out there they don't know yet. And when that happens, they believe they're the top and they're the apex, and there is no room for a god. And the last group uh, is the gray group, which is only 1% of the general public who don't know. And in science, it's 7%. And then next, if you look down at religious affiliations among the general public and scientists, you see a breakdown where the blue is nothing in particular, the 12%, and here it goes up to 20. Atheist is 17% of scientists, whereas it's only two of the general public. And agnostic, meaning I don't know and I don't want to claim something, is 2% of the general populace, but 11% it's much larger, this blue and green area of non-religious than it is right here where it only constitutes about 16%. So we see a huge shift in this community in our nation. And lastly, looking at religious beliefs among uh, scientists. So all scientists, 33% believe in a God, 41% don't believe in either. But when you look down at the fields, chemistry has a higher belief in God than atheists in the chemistry fields. And yet, the geosciences, this is the one that I'm not surprised by, these two, because these are the ones that give me the questions. If you are going to be a Christian and believe in the global flood, and you're a geologist, there is no way that you're going to believe this happened, and we'll get into some of that in the next few weeks. If you want to look at the age of the universe and say, we have the math, it's 13.7 billion years old, and you're saying this is only 6,000 years, that's crazy. So it does not surprise me at all to see that <coughs> biological and medical, in fact, I would expect this to be much higher in the biological and medical fields, because when you start looking at the DNA and the things we're going to look at there, it looks created. It does not look like it just happened. But in the areas where the sciences are applied to observation, you can observe these things and make strong inferences based on them, and that's why I believe we see this breakdown as we do. And we'll get into some of that in the next few weeks. And just to kind of balance this out and not have you think that every scientist is on one side versus the general population, Right here is probably the most militant atheist there is. It's Richard Dawkins. And he wrote a book, The God Delusion and other books. And he is you know, vehemently opposed to Christianity and believes that religion is the greatest cause of uh, war and unhappiness on this planet. And if we all just realized there is no God, there is nothing out there, we wouldn't fight anymore and we'd all be okay. But counter to that is Francis Collins. And in 2009, he was President Barack Obama's appointed uh, director of the Human Genome Project, or he was the Human Genome Project, and he was actually promoted to um, Director of National Institutes of Health. So he, he was put in that position, even though he's an evangelical Christian. So we have both sides of this. Parts of science still 
in very high places are Christian. Not every one of them is atheistic. So 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, this is the need to be right. And 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3 says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying their master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned, and their greed they will exploit with their false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, nor their destruction is asleep, not asleep. And this is what Patrick was talking about earlier. People want to be right. People want to have their way. You know, we want the world to serve us much of the time instead of us serve God and do the things we should do. We want things to be easy for us. We want things to be satisfactory for us. And the problem is, in our culture, in our society now where we live, it's getting a lot easier and when everything gets easier and easier and easier for you, when you're told to deny yourself and take up your cross daily, that's not nearly as appealing as just getting what I want. And so I think this is the need to be right becomes a huge, huge deterrent for these people who think they're at the top of their field, who think they are the experts. And how could these crazy people who believe in um, superstitious beliefs and non-scientific ideas, how could they be right? And I used this example uh, last year when I was in the pulpit. Wilt Chamberlain was a terrible free throw shooter. And yet he worked with Rick Barry, who was the all, or he's number two all time, leading free throw shooter in percentage in the NBA. And Rick Barry shot underhanded. So as opposed to just a traditional shot, he actually put it down between his legs and kind of flipped it up backwards. Wilt Chamberlain did this for one year and improved his free throw percentage greatly. But he's, he was embarrassed by the idea of having to shoot underhanded. And he went back to shooting overhanded and his percentage dropped again. Sometimes it takes some courage to stand out and do something a little bit differently than everybody else. And when the authority tells you, when the news media, when social media, when your friends, when you know, the overarching ideas of society tell you something is right, it's very hard to get out of that. Whether that be religious beliefs, political beliefs, whatever. But sometimes we have to do the science for ourselves. This was an experiment. You have data. You have percentages. And we'll get to this next week. All right. Thank you all.